a lot about the economic and environmental impact that the Deep Horizon oil rig explosion here in the Gulf of Mexico is going to have. Scientists and engineers looking at video of the wellhead are now saying it could be as many as 70,000 barrels of oil a day instead of the 1 to 5,000 first estimated by BP. What does that mean? What effect is that going to have? Well, I'm standing here in a North Florida salt marsh, just one of the many environmentally sensitive areas that are going to be impacted by the oil. What role does this complex ecosystem play in the marine environment? We often hear the salt marshes referred to as the nursery grounds of the Gulf, and here in Florida, uh, that certainly is true. In Florida, it's estimated that more than 70% of both our recreational and commercial saltwater species, the sea life that we harvest for the seafood industry, the mullet and shrimp, flounder, blue crabs and oysters, and the recreational species like trout or redfish, black drum and tarpon, just to name a few depend on these salt marshes for protection and for nourishment in at least some point during their life cycle. In a salt marsh, the plants are the foundation on which everything else is built. In the lower marsh, we find the cordgrass uh, Spartina alterniflora, and this is the area of the marsh that is most often flooded. A little higher up in the marsh, we find juncus grass, and it's oftentimes called black needle rush, and this is the main plant we see when we look out into the marsh. And then higher up still, we find smooth cord grass, uh, Spartina patens, and areas of glasswort and saltwort. All of these plants grow in vast numbers and in such close proximity to one another that they actually form a physical barrier, and it keeps out larger fish to provide a safe environment for fish fry and larval crab and shrimp to have a safe place to live and grow. Salt marsh plants have got extensive root systems, and these help to bind the soil here. They protect against storm surge and erosion. The plants absorb nutrients and pollution so they can act as a buffer between upland developments and the estuaries. Uh, the tidal creeks move these nutrients. As the tides come in, the salt marsh floods and it brings food for things like the periwinkle snails, the fiddler crabs, the blue crabs, the shrimp. So there's many animals here that depend upon the tide marshes. As these plants die and decay, uh, bacteria and fungus will help to break them down and they make parts of the plants available into the food chain that otherwise would not be digestible. As these tides flow back out, it takes these nutrients to the estuaries that make them such a, the rich environment that they are, that provide us with the blue crabs, the stone crabs, the pink shrimp, the red fish, all of the things that we love to eat and the recreational fish that we come here to fish for. In these tidal creeks, we find many kinds of fish mosquito fish and cell fin mollies. We also find the killifish like Fungulus simulus, the long-nosed killifish, and Fungulus grandus, the common killifish, Cyprinodon, the sheep's head killifish, and there are many flatfish. When we think of flatfish, we oftentimes think of the uh, southern flounder with its body covered with chromatophores and the ability to change its color to blend in with its environment to camouflage, but there are many other flatfish. We'll have tonguefish and uh, soles, the four spot flounder, and hog chokers. These fish don't get large enough to be commercially viable, but they're a very important part of the food chain here in the salt marsh. As the tidal flow exits the salt marsh, the nutrients are spread into the estuaries, feeding the oyster communities. And these in turn are harvested themselves, feeding a huge industry in areas like Apalachicola, where large mountains of oyster shells are recycled to be returned to the estuaries. And these provide a substrate for larval oysters to be able to settle on and grow, providing a renewable resource that feeds and fuels the seafood industry. There are many species of birds that visit these salt marshes each day. The great egrets and snowy egrets, tricolored or Louisiana heron, and many others that come here to feed. They feed on a multitude of life, the fish, the crabs, the shrimp, that live here in such great numbers. Others, like the red-winged blackbirds and the clapper rails, they build their nests here among the tangles of cord grass and needle rush, and this is where they raise their young feeding on the vast amount of insect life. And in the case of the clapper rails, hunting on the banks of these tidal creeks, you'll see them darting in and out of the cord grass, searching for fiddler crabs to be taken back to feed to their young.
birds clean themselves here in the waters in the marsh. And if these waters become coated with oil, their feathers are going to become covered with oil. The oil causes irritation to the skin, and as the birds try to preen their feathers to clean them, they end up ingesting the oil. And this can lead to tissue damage and organ failure. The way to protect these birds is to protect the marsh, to keep the oil out. There are very few reptiles that can be found in the salt marsh. The diamondback terrapin, these used to occur here by the hundreds in these marshes and the estuaries, but they're being killed off in the crab traps. They get into the crab traps and drown and they can't get out. I couldn't even find the salt marsh snake to show you one in this video, but as we're losing our marshes, we're losing species like the salt marsh snake. They're so hard to find now. And the third species of reptile you'll find in these marshes are the American alligators. They'll move from the freshwater areas to the saltwater areas, and here in this marsh, they spend a lot of the night here feeding on fish. Salt marshes, or tidal marshes as they're sometimes called, are one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. They're oftentimes described as having a very low diversity of life, but there's a very high density here. So I can agree with that in part. I think there's a very low diversity of the plant life, and we've gone through about the five different species of the plants that you can normally find in the salt marsh. But the animal life, as you've seen by the fish and the birds and the reptiles, there are many, many animals that come here and depend on these marshes. If these grasses die, the soils that these roots are binding will wash away and this marsh will just become an extension of the bay and it will be gone forever. So I hope that we can look back at all of the mistakes that have been made uh, along the coast of Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and we'll hope that we can build from that and start to correct them and continue to protect the marshes there but let's not let the oil enter into these marshes in Florida. We need to do whatever we can to protect this environment not just for ourselves but for future generations as well. After filming and observing these beautiful marshes over the last few weeks it's very disheartening to think that this could all just disappear. The time for finger pointing is over. It's time now to stop and take action and do whatever we can to preserve these marshes for future generations. I'd like to thank you for watching and I hope that in some small way that we've helped raise awareness that these salt marshes need to be protected. I'm Sci Diver Video and I look forward to your comments.